This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. On behalf of the BERT lectureship, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this event tonight, this talk by the distinguished scholar Tariq Ramadan. First, let me say a couple of words about the BERT lectureship and then welcome the person who will actually introduce our speaker tonight. BERT lectureship is an endowed lectureship here at UCSD that was established over 25 years ago in honor of Father Eugene Burke, who was a distinguished Catholic theologian who, and an Apollos priest who spent his last years here at UCSD in the campus ministry. And when he passed away, Many of the people who had been inspired by him donated money to help endow a lectureship on religion and society on this campus. And like Father Burt, the lectureship has been committed to providing the widest possible range of religious traditions, religious positions, and is committed to providing a forum for civil discourse uh, about the plurality of religion and ethical traditions that are part of our world today. So now let me welcome uh, Professor Michael Provence, professor from the History Department, who will have the honor of, of introducing our speaker tonight. Thank you for coming, and thanks uh, Professor Madsen and the Burke Lecture Series. This is something special. Uh, the lecture series is the Burke Lecture Series on Religion and Society. I hope you come back, uh, as, you, as, as uh, Professor Madsen said. It's a long and illustrious uh, list of speakers that will continue. It's a, a special privilege, a pleasure uh, for me to welcome to UCSD uh, Professor Tariq, Tariq uh, Ramadan this evening. Um, now, the organizers of the Burke Lecture Series asked me to try to give you some uh, idea of the breadth and influence and uh, distinction of his scholarship, and, and it's a pleasure to do that. There's a few important things that I want you to know about uh, uh, Professor Ramadan. Um, and I already, I met him this afternoon, I already have a sense that he's a, a modest and uh, gentle-hearted person who will not uh, be telling you too much about his own background, so I'd like to offer a little bit of that myself, if I may. Um, before I get to this question, uh, I want to offer a little bit of a conventional uh, uh, background, a conventional introduction. Uh, professor Tariq Ramadan is uh, Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He holds an MA in philosophy uh, from the University of Geneva and a PhD in European philosophy from the University of Geneva. He studied at Al-Azhar University in Cairo. This is the oldest university in the world. Uh, and there he underwent intensive, intensive tutoring in Islamic, uh, classical Islamic studies and Islamic law. Um, he has written uh, at least 10 books that I could count, and I'm going to mention these books. Now, sometimes when one is, is uh, introducing a, a distinguished speaker, the books go by rather quickly. I want 
to ask you to pay special attention to the title of these books because this is very important and indicative of the, the contribution that he has made. Uh, so a few of the titles. The Quest for Meaning, Developing a, Thil a Philosophy of Pluralism, just recently published. What I Believe, published in 2009. Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation, 2009. In the Footsteps of the Prophet, Lessons from the Life of Muhammad, 2007. Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, Islam the West and the Challenge of Modernity, and to be a European Muslim in 1999. Over the, the course of this extraordinary career, he has been continually concerned with questions of contemporary Islamic philosophy, the concerns and day-to-day -day questions of Muslims living in European and non-Muslim majority countries, religious pluralism, and especially most especially, how Muslims, and by extension all immigrants, uh, can become full and productive citizens in the countries where they live. He's the leading advocate for the idea that Muslims in Europe and elsewhere should strive for full civic engagement in the countries they live. I, I, I quote uh, the back of, of, uh, of one of his books. Western Muslims, he calls on Western Muslims to escape the mental, social, cultural, and religious ghettos they have created for themselves and become full partners in the democratic societies in which they live. At the same time, he calls for the rest of us, that is to say the non-Muslim majority within these countries, uh, to recognize our Muslim neighbors as citizens with rights and responsibilities the same as everyone. His vision is of a future in which a shared and confident pluralism becomes a reality at last. Now, I think it's ironic and necessary to point out that many of his critics, and he has critics, uh, are also critics of immigrants in general. And these critics, especially in Europe, uh, call for, perennially call for an idea of integration and <clears throat> claim that refusal to Im integrate is why Muslims and immigrants in general, but especially Muslims, don't belong in these societies. Now, I, I want to draw your attention to the passage on the back of the book jacket and the claims of these critics, which I find ironic and in direct contradiction with one another, actually. He is calling for what they are calling integration, and they are claiming that integration doesn't exist, and that's why these societies cannot accommodate, cannot include Muslims as full citizens. Now, he has the further distinction of being banned by the government of Tunisia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Libya, and Syria, and this is quite a long time ago, many more people have been added to this list recently, uh, because of his criticism of these undemocratic regimes that deny the most basic human rights to their citizens. Uh, so this is quite a distinction, and this is a distinction that not so many people have, and this goes back several years. Not just the last year, several years. So. We have, by any standard here with us tonight, an extraordinarily distinguished uh, uh, scholar, the leading uh, Muslim intellectual in Europe and North America. Uh, he is a Swiss citizen. He, is born in, he was born in Switzerland. Uh, he's cultured in English and French and widely published in both languages. And yet, as Professor Ramadan himself acknowledges, <clears throat> he's been a lightning rod for controversy. And I, I wonder why uh, he is anything but a, a intellectual, a public intellectual of universal renown, actually. And why, or the question that I'm asking now is why he would be a lightning rod for controversy. I don't think it's the Swiss connection. <laughs> I, I spent some time in Switzerland in Geneva last year, and I can attest that it is a, a city, a very calm place. Uh, there's not anything offensive about Switzerland. Chocolate watches, Swiss army knives. The controversy, I think, is based on fear, ignorance, and sometimes political calculation and manipulation. And I would say that that kind of ignorance, we call it Islamophobia sometimes, uh, but it's a mistrust of immigrants and somehow people who are claimed not to fit in society generally, harms everyone. When Newt Gingrich, for example, claims that he is opposed to Sharia law in, in the United States and that by implication others are not opposed to Sharia law, uh, this is ignorance. It's ignorance of what Islamic law is. I promise that 
that uh, former Speaker Gingrich knows nothing about Islamic law, what it is, what it is not. So this is ignorance, but it's also manipulation for political gain. When German, Swiss, French, and English politicians on the right say that Muslims threaten European culture, this is ignorance and manipulation. Ignorance of Islam, ignorance of any Muslim neighbors or fellow citizens, uh, and manipulation of non-Muslim fellow citizens. And this hurts everyone. Now, an example of how it hurts everyone is the following. In 2004, uh, Professor uh, Ramadan was offered the, uh, the Henry R. Luce Chair in Religion, Conflict, and Peacebuilding at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for International, in International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He prepared to move, he packed his things, I believe, was ready to uh, uh, leave with his family, to move to South Bend, Indiana, to assume this, this, uh, this distinguished chair. Uh, Notre Dame was excited, uh, students were excited, many people were excited. The Bush administration denied him a visa without explanation. Uh, there were a number of inquiries, first by uh, Notre Dame, then by uh, the ACLU and a number of other groups. Eventually, after a period of several, of two years, the State Department, uh, a U.S. consular official said that the, uh, the visa had been denied uh, because uh, Dr. Ramadan was inadmissible based solely on his actions which constituted providing material support to a terrorist organization. No further explanation was given. Now, it's a happy ending for him, but as I say, this kind of thing hurts everyone. It hurts us, because Notre Dame lost, and Oxford won. And that's why, that's one of the ways that uh, this hurt. But in a more significant and profound way, it hurt uh, the cause of pluralism. It hurt the United States. It hurt students at Notre Dame. It didn't hurt Oxford, but it hurt these, this cohesive, uh, unified, pluralist society that we all uh, hope to foster. So uh, we're very fortunate that in any event, he has come back uh, to the United States so that we can benefit from his thoughts this evening. Let's join uh, Professor Tarek Ramadan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction, Professor Provence. I, I'm quite impressed by uh, the way uh, you introduced me this evening. It's not, I'm not used to that, and, and that's especially in the United States. And I think that uh, knowing what happened before and what is happening in, uh, uh, in, in my life and my academic work, I think that uh, uh, it's a fair uh, presentation of what I'm trying to do in within the uh, uh, my my life in the West, but also when I'm also dealing with uh, what is happening in Muslim majority countries, and I will talk about this this evening. And once again, I want also to pro to to thank Professor Manson and and uh, uh, the organizers for this invitation. Uh, for this Burke lecture this evening. Thank you so much and, and thank you for also being here. Um, I will try to, to, to tackle the issue and, and, and try to, to talk about interpreting Islam in modern context uh, in, two, in two ways. It's first to start with uh, uh, the framework, the theoretical framework. I think it's important. You, you, you talked about ignorance and, and very often the perception that Islam is uh, monolithic, that there are no trends, that Islam is against anything which has to do with, uh, you know, changes in modern life. I think what we have to reassess this by coming to the roots of the, 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 the Islamic legal tradition and, and the, the, the very uh, deep philosophy of law and, and jurisprudence and and also this perception and how do we remain faithful to a tradition while dealing with a, a changing world. And I think that uh, very often when it comes to Islam, 
many Muslims themselves, they don't get the, the, the knowledge, the deep knowledge of this tradition, because very often they are challenged uh, about their very uh, uh, understanding of Islam or being or not integrated in Western society or looking at what is happening in the Muslim majority countries. Uh, the perception is that uh, Islam now and the Muslim majority countries have mainly to do with dictatorships and, and not really at the forefront on anything which has to do with science and development. And, and I think that we have to come to, to this understanding. So the first part of my talk will be about the theoretical framework and then to come to practical things that what uh, can be done and should be done and what are the challenges in fact for contemporary Muslims and the contemporary Muslim mind when it comes to uh, experimental sciences, human sciences and, 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 and what is happening for example uh, now in what we call the Arab Spring. I, I'm just publishing a book now about the Arab awakening and Islam and the New Middle East and I'm, I'm not using two words, I don't use spring because I'm not sure yet that we are witnessing something which is like the spring and the real democratic processes. I think, as I'm always repeating, I'm cautiously optimistic about what is happening in the Middle East. And, and I'm not using the concept of revolutions. I think that they are still, if not an achieved revolution, at least unfinished revolution, and we have still to see what is going to happen if you follow what is happening in all the countries, even now with all the difficulties that the Tunisian uh, society is facing. I think we have really to be cautious as to our conclusions when it comes to what is happening. But uh, uh, let me start with the theoretical framework and, and start with a, a short introduction and to come then to some of the, the challenges that uh, uh, we are facing. And if at the end of the first part, when it comes to understanding the roots of this theoretical framework, you feel that it's complex and complicated, just know that I would be happy. <laughs> because this is the problem that I have very often. When it comes to deal with another tradition, is to be very simplistic and a, you know, a binary vision. It's either you are modern or you are not. Either you are like us or you are the alien. Uh, as you are like us or you are you know, constructing otherness out of our very simplistic understanding. And the very starting point of respect when it comes to pluralism is to acknowledge the fact that from the very beginning, the other tradition is as complex as yours. If you are a Christian, if you are an, a Jew, if you are a Buddhist, if you, if you are an atheist, if you are an agnostic, you are coming from very complex traditions. We don't have one type of atheism, not one type of Jewish tradition or Christian tradition. It's very complex. The Muslim Islamic tradition is as complex as all the others. And we have to understand there are trends, there are tensions, there are questions, there are challenges, there are dialogue from within. I am not representing all the Muslims. And it's so much the case that for some Muslims, I'm no longer a Muslim. I'm outside the realm of what they think Islam is. And we need to know this because if we want to be clear on our understanding, we should understand the internal dynamics of our respective traditions. And sometimes this is what is missing in interfaith dialogue. We are talking to the, or preaching to the converts, all the people who are involved very often, they are open to the other, but we don't assess how much is difficult within our respective tradition to talk to our people, to be able to have an intra community dialogue. So I'm not representing, I'm coming from the reformist tradition and I will explain what does it mean, uh, but it's not, you know, and it's not, you know, because you, you hear, be careful also with words, you, you know, reformist tradition, it's mainly positive, so uh, it's not the bad versus uh, the good Muslim, as I have been witnessing so many times with the previous administration in this country and very much with the populists, you know, that we have in the States now and that we are uh, uh, having for many years in Europe. The Populist Party are always portraying the other through a binary vision, the good Muslims and the bad Muslims. 
And the traditions are more complex than this, between the literalist, the reformist, the traditionalist, the mystical trends, uh, the rationalist, and the political uh, uh, understandings and interpretation. It's complex. In, in, in uh, one of my books, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, I'm describing the different trends, and it's not one, it's not two, it's seven to eight trends. And within the trends, you have specific trends, so it's quite complex. Having said that now, and it comes to uh, uh, the starting point of this diversity, I'm not uh, uh, following some sociologists. When they want to deal with the diversity, they start by saying, we don't have Islam or one Islam, we have Islams, and they put an S. And sometimes this S is the very way, the very easy way to say, oh, you know, it's complex. We have many Islams, as if you have many uh, Christianisms and Judaisms. I think we have to be very, when we are working from within and you are dealing with uh, theology and sociology and history, you understand when it comes to religious traditions, you will find among all the Muslims around the world, the Sunni and the Shia tradition, that there are common principles that they all agree. And this is what is known as the creed, the aqidah in Arabic, or the pillars of our practice, that the, the, the ibadat, you will find them the same everywhere. So from a religious viewpoint, we have one Islam that is uh, based on some common principles. Now, all the Muslims, Shia and Sunni, and within the tradition, even with the, you know, in history, we have up to 30 schools of law, madahib, in, in different, you know, the Sunni and the Shia, all together. There is something which is important. They all ag agree on the scriptural sources. There are two sets of texts, the Quran, which is the revelation, and the prophetic tradition what the messenger of the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, uh, was saying or implementing or accepting as something which is part of our tradition. Now, if we have and we agree on the fact that we have two sets of texts, the first level of diversity is with interpretations. So we have one Islam and many interpretations. And add to this first level of diversity, we have many cultures that are going to uh, uh, direct the interpretations depending where you live, how do you read the text. So this is the starting point of this diversity within Islam that we have to get. There is one Islam as to the common principles and many interpretations as to understanding the text and many ways of implementing the text depending on the cultures. And the universality of Islam, and you get that from the very beginning, the universality of Islam is not uniformity. The universality of Islam is the common principles accepting a diversity of interpretations and cultures. So the universality is not uniformity, is common principles translated in different ways or understood differently depending on your interpretation and depending on your culture. Having said that, the, what happened from the very beginning is when it came to these interpretations is to understand that uh, uh, when the scholars started to deal with the text, and first for the Muslims as something which is part of the creed, something which is part of the, uh, uh, the principles of Islam, for the Muslims the Quran is the very word of God. So they read the text and they have many interpretations as to what the text is saying. And then what they did from the very beginning is to try to understand that uh, how the text is constructed, how it's built, how we can understand it. And the first thing that they did is, when you read the text, you will differentiate between different types of verses. So some verses are clear-cut. There is no room for interpretation. And other texts are open for interpretation. So we have a first categorization that came from the very beginning, which is uh, al-qatai, when the texts are clear-cut, no room for interpretations. And and this is where we have the principles of Islam that are accepted by all the Muslims. And other texts, 
that are open for interpretation. So you have the first attitude which is categorizing within and in the light of the text itself. And then if you come to the Islamic sciences, you will have a, a science, a specific science called Ulum al-Qur'an, the, the sciences of the Qur'an itself. And then what the scholars did is not only we need to understand and to categorize within the text, but we need in order to understand the text to get the context within which this text was revealed. So the connection between the text and the context at the time of revelation. This is the first dialectical process for the scholars. It's a text. What does this text mean revealed in this specific context? And you have to deal for that with chronology, context, culture, and respective understanding at that time. So this is one of the main problems that we can have between two schools. The literalist would say the context is not so important. The literalist would say. The reformist would say there is no way for you to get the meaning of the text if you don't understand the context within which it was revealed. So you have to have this dialectical process between text and context. And context, like anyone who has studied the Christian theology, can understand this contextualized approach of the text within a specific context. This is part of the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition. We all deal with this, and the Muslims were dealing with this from the very beginning. And what they did also, the scholars were saying, with the text, when it comes to the principles that you extract from the Quran and the, 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 the principles that you extract from the prophetic tradition, you will see that they are verses and principles that, that, that are immutable, trans-historical. They are to be implemented whoever you are, whatever you live, and wherever you are. For example, wherever are the Muslims, they will see, you will see that they pray five times a day in San Diego as well as in uh, Egypt or every, this is trans-historical. These are the pillars. We fast one month a year everywhere. And you have some principles and some understanding that are changeable and we have to change them depending on the context. It might be, for example, the, the different cultural dimensions that were right in the countries of origin and that you have to adapt depending where you are. So it's changeable. So you have immutable and changeable. This is where you deal with the text in a specific context when we try to get the very understanding of the Quran. But it's not enough. You have a double dialectical process. Why? Because now you have to extract the principles and to try to implement this principle in a new context. So in order to be faithful to the text, you have to go through a double dialectical process. What does the text say in the light of the context of its revelation, and in which way you extract the principle in order to implement it in a specific context within which you live now. So you extract the principle and you come with it in a specific new context. In order to be faithful to the principle, you need to understand the context on which and with which you are dealing today. So these tensions is something which is everywhere in the reformist tradition. And this is why I was saying, and I'm repeating in all my work, there is no faithfulness to the text without evolution in our understanding. You need to reform your mind in order to get the right understanding. Why? Because you are dealing with new context. So this is a tension which is difficult it's always easy to quote the text and to literally implement the text. It's easy, but we are clearly not sure that it's going to be faithful to what the text is saying. Because you keep the meaning and the literal meaning, you don't understand the objective. You should be faithful to the objective of the text, not the literal meaning of the text. Because sometimes by being faithful to the literal meaning, you are missing the objective. I told you it's going to be complex. <laughs> but I want you to get that. We are here dealing with something. If we want to resist ignorance, we have to come with, look, it's serious what we are talking about here. It's are the contemporary Muslims equipped 
with a tradition that is helping them to deal with contemporary challenges. So are not, they are not coming from nowhere. If you take all the books, and by the way, there are 10 in English and, and 30 in all the languages. So if you come to all the texts, what I'm trying to say is that it's rooted within a tradition. And this tradition is a very long tradition of science and knowledge that if you are dealing with contemporary Muslims, don't deal with them as if they are not coming from nowhere, just coming to the West and say, now we are waiting for you to integrate. As if to integrate is, show us that you think as much as we think. And forgetting the very long tradition of, you know, legal sciences and, and sciences and, and the very long tradition of philosophers in, in, first, in philosophy, in law, we have a very, very profound and very deep tradition of philosophy of law in Islam. So we need to come with this. It doesn't mean that we are stuck in the past, but we are referring to this tradition in order to be equipped to deal with contemporary issues. And we are coming from somewhere. So what, for example, in one of the books that are, I'm challenging our underst the contemporary understanding of our legislation in radical reform, I'm coming with this very old tradition, saying to the Muslims, I speak from within, and saying to people of outer faith, if you want to deal with Muslims, you also have to deal with their tradition. It's, it's a serious matter. It has to do with knowledge. We are not dealing here at the periphery of our knowledge. We are dealing at, with the center of our faithfulness to a tradition. And if we want to live together, don't expect from anyone to feel good in his or her society if you are asking her or him to live at the periphery of her or his tradition. There is no well-being if you are not at the center, if you don't feel good with whom you, who you are, where you are. So we need to come with this uh, understanding as something which is uh, very important and to understand that uh, there is a very uh, long tradition here in uh, Islam. And then if we come to a second level, uh, what the scholars were, were trying to understand when they were dealing with the Islamic principles is two things. Uh, the first is, when you deal with the text, even when the text is clear-cut, you should understand what are the objectives, what are the conditions that are necessary to implement the text, and what is the raison d'être, what we call in Arabic, al so all this is what the jurists, the fuqaha in Arabic, were dealing when they were dealing with the text. What is the raison d'être of a specific rule to get which objectives and with which conditions? So these were something which uh, were important in the very, the very beginning. And if you want to deal with this, there is something which was very important for the scholars. If you want to understand the raison d'être, if you want to understand the conditions and you want to keep the objective, you are obliged from the very beginning to deal with the context, to know the society. This is why all the scholars from the very beginning were saying, if you want to be serious in the legal tradition, there is no way but to know the state of affairs of your society. You need to implement the law and to implement the, the Islamic ethics to know the culture, to know the society, to get the knowledge. And this is why from the very beginning in the Islamic tradition, the scholars were saying Al-Urf is part of the Islamic source. Al-Urf is customs and cultures are part of your reference when you implement the law. And you need to get the culture. And this is why you have today something which is the same principles for all the Muslims around the world, but if you go to West Africa, you go to North Africa, you go to Africa, to Asia, you will find something which is important, is that all the Muslims are Muslims as to their principles and Western Africans as to their cultures, North African, Asian, and the great majority of the Muslims, by the way, are not Arabs. Are Asian and non-Arabs are the majority. And the point here is, they had no problem to deal with the surrounding culture. Why? Because from the very old tradition, they were told the cultures are yours and you can take whatever is good. Why? Because we have a principle in Islam, 
the principle in everything when it comes to law is permission. Take whatever is good. I want to tell you this now because what I'm facing with European and Western Muslims in the United States of America, in Canada, in Australia and in Europe is that this point is missed. Why? Because there is a lack of confidence. What the previous generations did in Africa is to take from the African country and to say we are African and Muslims. No problem. We are Arabs and Muslims. We are Asian and Muslims. Now you are American and Muslims. It's not a problem. You will take from the surrounding culture exactly what was done in the past. So the contemporary challenge of being an American Muslim should be dealt with the way they dealt in Africa, in Asia, everywhere in the world. But you should be confident that you are equipped with your understanding of the text and your deep understanding of the culture. But there is only one thing that you have to do. If you are a European Muslim, or if you are an American Muslim, or if you are a Canadian Muslim, you can't be faithful to the texts in the way you implement the rules in this country if you don't know the history of the country, the culture of the country, and the legislation of the country. Your challenge is to know where you live. What is the collective psychology? What is the culture? And not only the language. I'm always saying to the people, be careful. You think that by, because you know the language of the country, you are rooted in the culture. No. And there is always one thing that I keep on repeating. If you want to know, if you feel, if you are really part of a specific culture, it's not through the language that you will get it. It's very strange. There are two dimensions, two specific dimensions where you can feel that you are really rooted in a culture. The first one is arts and creativity. If you read a poem in a language and you get the beauty through the language, there is this feeling that this is your culture. And sometimes you know English and you don't get it at all. In English poetry. It's like, oh, it seems to be nice. <laughs> it seems to be beautiful. You get the very, the deep, you know, dimension through the creativity. And it's very serious here because when you deal with text and being faithful to the Islamic tradition and you say God is beautiful and he likes beauty, Allahu Jamil Yuhibbul Jamal, this is one of the, uh, uh, one of the prophetic tradition. Beauty comes from literature, and literature is the way you keep this culture and you are imbibed with the culture. And the second thing which is part of uh, something that can be a parameter on which you can see, on the scale of which you can feel that you are part of a, a society and a culture, is something which is exactly what happened right now, is the sense of humor. The sense of humor is revealing you belonging to a specific culture. And you can see that sometimes you speak English, you, then get, you don't get why the Americans are laughing. You speak Arabic and you don't get it. You are in an Arabic country and you don't get why they are laughing. Because in laughing there is emotion, language, feeling and psychology. And you have to get that. So there will be no American Muslims and American Islam based on the same Islamic principles with the American culture if the American Muslims don't get this understanding from within. The sensitivity, the emotion, the psychology, that they have to do it. So this is the only way to be faithful. And it's not going to come with the scholars coming from Switzerland. Because you don't get it. It's not going to come with a scholar coming from Saudi Arabia because he doesn't get it. This is the local responsibility of the people living here. So this is why we need scholars coming from where they, from the country. Not only speaking the language, but deeply rooted in memory, feeling, collective psychology in order to be faithful to the texts and integrating what is coming from the culture. And in one of the books that you mentioned, The Quest for Meaning, I'm saying we need to reconcile our students with four disciplines. 
not only Muslims, by the way, all the, 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 the students. The first one is history. The set, because we need to have this understanding. You belong to a country when you have part of its memory. And history is part, it's, it's essential. The second is to teach philosophy, the deep question of why. The second is history of the third, the, the history of religions. Just if you want to be serious about pluralism, if we are not teaching religions, why the tea parties and the populists are so 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 strong? Because you, you mentioned this, because they are nurturing fear. And how are why are they able to nurture fear so easily? Not because the Muslims are so scary. The Muslims can be scary when the Jews, the Christian, the atheists, the agnostic, the Buddhist don't know enough about their own tradition. When you don't know who you are, you are scared of who you are not. This is a natural process that we can get to emotional politics because we are working on your own ignorance of your own self. So you need this kind of knowledge. And the third, the fourth discipline is arts and imagination and creativity that we need to teach. But this is something that we have to be equipped from an Islamic viewpoint if we want serious about the modern challenge of being Muslims today. And it's true in the Muslim majority countries. It's what is lacking in the Muslim majority countries is about their own history, their own legacy, their own uh, heritage, their own, uh, even their own language. One of the main problems that we have in Muslim majority countries in Arab country is the, the relationship between Muslims and Arabic. In the way we teach Arabic, in the way we teach uh, critical thinking. So we can't be faithful to the principles if there is not a great deal of critical thinking. Because critical thinking is, okay, here is the text and here is my society. How do I, I get this, this relationship, this tension? If I am not a follower, just imitating what was done in the past, and that I want to be faithful to the very essence of the text, I need to get with this knowledge. And this critical thinking is essential. And, and it's, a, it's a contemporary challenge. So this is, this tension and the, the, the condition and, and the raison d'etre is what is known in the Arabic tradition as ishtihad, the critical reasoning when the text is absent or the text is open for interpretation. And then, at the end, with the theoretical framework, what is necessary for us to come to a better understanding of the contemporary challenges is to rely on four main uh, dimensions that we have to keep in mind when we are trying to be faithful to the scriptural sources. And by the way, when I'm talking like this, anyone who is dealing with uh, his or her own religion as a Jew, as a Christian, as a Muslim, and even from a philosophical background or a spiritual background as Buddhist, as Hinduist, as, you know, atheist, trying to be faithful to human rights, for example, if it's on the only reference, you will see that we are all dealing with these four dimensions. The first one is how do we keep in the legal tradition or in the spiritual tradition meaning, the meaning, meaning as the essential thing that we want to keep. Not the rituals, not the formalist approach, but the meaning of things. Don't tell me that I have to pray, teach me why should I pray. So which is the starting point of educating? Is, is not to come only with the principles as a, in a formalistic way, but to get the substance. And it's very important to any uh, religious uh, tradition just to keep this, because very often we end up confusing the means with the goals. To pray is a means and the goals is to be close to God. But if you forget the goals, you end up thinking that the only thing that you have to do is to pray and you become formalistic in all the, with all the rituals. So this is something that we have to keep the meaning, and to get this, it's what we, we, we have to keep the meaning is always to question the ends, why? So this is the school that I have been uh, studying and, and, and trying to promote as part of the work that I'm doing within the Islamic tradition, is Madrasat al-Maqasid, the school of the objectives. So to remain and to try always to question what are the objectives of our tradition in order not to forget the meaning of what we are doing. So to think about the law in the light of the objectives. And this is something which is important. With some of the literalists, sometimes when we are asking them why, 
They don't care about the objective. They just are obsessed with the limits. This is lawful, this is unlawful. And not coming with why this is lawful and why this is unlawful. Why are we doing this? So forgetting the objectives. And if we are forgetting the objectives, we are obsessed with this mentality of the rituals and not trying to understand why we are doing what we are doing. So this is a, a tension that we have within the community. Now, if we have the objectives and we have uh, the meaning, we have to question our methodology. And the methodology is how do we deal with the text in a specific period of time, so the methodology is important, and then with the methodology we have priorities. How do we prioritize? What comes first? What are the essential things in our religion? And this is important for us in the contemporary world. Why? Because very often when you are on the defensive, and this is the case for all the religious uh, traditions. What we feel in the industrialized world, in the modern world, is that religion is not so important and sometimes the people are laughing at you being, you know, still believing in God and, and, and praying. So you see, I'm praying five times a day. Huh. Means that you are a bit backward and, and not really modern. The fact that you, the, the, the fact that you are on the defensive it's very easy when you are in the defensive to come with the rules, not with the meaning, and to protect yourself with this is legal and this is not legal. So you, are, you become very formalistic in the way you deal with your religion. So the spiritual dimension is lost for protecting the rituals, protecting the prohibitions and the duties, as if this is the only way to be faithful to tradition. And this is very dangerous for all of us. When you are pushed to be on the defensive and you end up being formalistic. And to, to, to keep the, the prohibitions and the rituals in a way to be faithful to your religion, while the only way to be faithful to religious tradition is to keep its spirituality, its meaning. This is where we are faithful to a religious tradition. What is the very essence of you being with God, you being with his message and trying to be faithful to this. So this is where we need to get the priorities and not to turn the whole thing with protecting the secondary issues and not coming to the very essence. So you have, for example, in many of our societies is when you are doing something that you are not drinking alcohol, when you are praying five times a day or we are wearing the headscarf as we had in France, and in, in, uh, which is not the case here, but very often this perception that because you wear the headscarf, you are backward and oppressed as a woman, you end up defending the headscarf and the right to wear it but not explaining the very essence, the spiritual essence of it. Why do you do this? You can agree or disagree, but the point is talk about the meaning, not about the, only about the right. The right could be there, but when you are always pushed to defend your rights, you end up not explaining the meaning of things, the spiritual thing. So you are on the defensive and this is a challenge for all of us, by the way, for all the religious traditions, it's a challenge in the way we deal with this. Now, so this is the theoretical framework. And I, I really want you to get the sense that it's coming from a very long tradition, that there are tensions within, there are discussions within, and this is where we are trying to keep the meaning, discuss the methodology, trying to, to, to remember the objectives, and then to work on the priorities. This is where we are dealing with the challenges of our time. So for the Muslims today, when it comes to uh, what uh, we are dealing, we are challenged uh, at different levels. So there are three main fields where uh, the Muslims, for example, with other traditions are challenged. And the first one is what we are facing with experimental sciences, for example, when it comes to, okay, what are we going to do when it comes to our religion and we are facing what we know, for example, today with uh, medical sciences, for example. And this is where, by the way, the Muslims succeeded in having something which is a very interesting, they are update and, and really at the forefront of some interesting discussion when it comes, for example, to new things that we have with uh, cloning, euthanasia, for example. How do, you, how do you define the brain death? How do you define death? 
and how are you, is going to, to, to how kind of answer are you going to give on 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 organ donation and trans, uh, 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 transplantation all this contemporary discussion that we have in science these are challenges where the religious traditions all the religious traditions and the muslims are challenged and what we have now is answers that are coming from the the for example the the uh, islamic tradition which is exactly what we are doing and what i was expressing from the very beginning you come back to the text you extract the principle you come with the contemporary uh, 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 discoveries and knowledge and you try to extract from the text things that are updated and helping you to have what in fact what we call Islamic ethics in medicine so this is where we are for example at the European level in, I am in, in some commissions we are working on this and we are working on how do we deal now with contemporary issues where we still are trying to keep an ethical framework in the way we deal with science so meaning that for today we should not disappear when it comes to science science should be an autonomous field where the scientific and the specialists are doing the job but at one point they are reaching limits and they are questioning the very meaning of life so what for example when an, a, a, a mother of a, 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 a woman can just bear the, 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 the kids of her daughter because her daughter cannot get a children, a child, sorry. So when she cannot get a child, we ask the mother of the, the, the woman to bear it for her. Is this ethical? It's now scientifically possible. And you know that it has, it has happened even in some European countries. So we are questioned. And what we are now uh, witnessing is that very interesting Islamic position on this by saying what is possible and the ethical position for example organ transplantation and organ donation what the Islamic tradition is saying on applied Islamic ethics is all this is possible we don't have a problem with this why because the principle of life comes before the principle of death so organ donation is possible in Islam. So we have this, and this is coming from what? Something that we are experiencing in experimental sciences. And it's important to understand that. Why? Because this is where, for example, we have a word that is not well used in the public media because it has been used in very specific uh, uh, situations, is the concept of fatwa. Fatwa is a legal opinion. A, a scholar is giving a legal opinion or counsel is giving a local opinion. And for example, anything which has to do with, for example, uh, 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 death or, or how do we deal with the body, how do we deal with uh, uh, organ uh, uh, donation, for example, this is the council, the councils are issuing fatawa, which are legal opinions, helping the Muslims to find a way with contemporary sciences. And it, it, it shows how dynamic it could be when it comes to applied science. Now, when we are dealing with human sciences, this is where we have exactly the same process. It's more complex, more difficult. Why? Because we are dealing with principles that sometimes are perceived as at risk when it comes to what is possible in a contemporary society. So uh, this is where, for example, uh, the contemporary challenges that we have is what, for example, are we going to do when we live as Muslims in non-Muslim society? So how are we going to deal with this? This is a, this is a contemporary issue. And by the way, it's not new. All the people who are saying, you know, the Western Muslims are experiencing something which is completely new in history, that's wrong. If you study what is happening, what happened in African countries, for example, or in India, Muslims were in minority in many countries for centuries. It's not new. And they managed to find a way to deal with the contemporary, uh, the, 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 the environment by issuing you know, legal opinions about how do we deal with your fellow citizens and your fellow uh, members within the society. Now, what the Muslims are experiencing as a contemporary challenge is what, how, do, do we, how do we come to uh, 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 be a, or remain a Muslim in secular societies, for example, in the United States of America or European countries. And you can see what has happened over the last 50 years and I'm, I keep on repeating this to people who, 
once again are not studying is that we are witnessing a, an intellectual revolution in the way the Muslims are dealing with the surrounding society. 30, 40 years ago, the scholars were saying to the Muslims, don't take the nationality of the country. Don't, don't be involved in the society. One day you will go back home. Because for all of us, the first waves of immigrants, they, they were coming to work and one day they would go back home. Except, in fact, maybe in the United States of America and Canada because it's an immigrant country. So it's a country of immigration. With the exception that what we are witnessing now with some of the, the tea parties and some of the neoconservatives is to differentiate between immigrants. They are the white, real good Americans and the not so good Americans. And uh, they are true Americans and not so true Americans. And if you are a Muslim, it's by definition suspicious. And you get that. And that's not new. For years, I was thinking myself that it will never come to the States. Why? Because this was a country of immigration. And it's coming now. And it has been the case not uh, since uh, September 11, 2001. It's a very new phenomenon that we have now people pushing. And they are now questioning, uh, creating a new type of other alienated citizen. Yesterday and for years and, and decades in, in this country, it was, and still is, by the way, even though you have the first African-American president in this country, it's still very difficult to be an African-American in this country and to get the same rights and to be respected the way you should be. We still are dealing at the grassroots level with racism and structural discriminations. This is the reality of the country. If you don't get that, if you are dream, if you keep on repeating that there is this American dream, there is an American dream for some Americans. Not for all. Some are still living with this structural discrimination. What some now are pushing, they are creating a new other. And the new other is very often the American with a Muslim background and saying, be careful. These Muslims, they want to come and they want to implement Sharia. They want to implement their principles in this country and they are not ready to integrate. So they are silently colonizing the country. We are losing our identity. Our identity, by the way, if you ask them what it is exactly, say, we don't know. What we know is that what they are not. These people are not like us. But it's serious. It's very serious because it works. This is emotional politics based on fear, mistrust, and something which is a romanticized definition of what it means to be an American by opposition to others. So you, you are able to say who we are by defining who we think they are. And they are not who we are. So this is the creation of the other, which is very, you know, it's a very long process. We heard this uh, with colonizing, you know, uh, forces, people going to uh, uh, Africa and doing exactly, creating the same thing. When Muslims, are dealing with these kind of things everywhere now in the European country, it's a contemporary challenge, is how are you going to define yourself? What is your identity? Are you going to define yourself against the people who want exactly you to do this? Because what the, the, the populists want you to do is exactly this, is they are creating the other for you to try to define yourself as the other and say, okay, no, I'm not what you think I am, and by doing and being on the defensive, you do exactly what is expected. And you have to just deconstruct the whole thing and come to what I was saying, is how do you come back to the text? How do you understand the environment? And how do you show and, and, and build a sense of belonging to the country based on the positive interpretation of the text and the deep understanding of the surrounding culture. How do you create this beyond what some are trying to do, beyond the perception? And this is why I keep on repeating one of the main challenges in the contemporary time for Muslims is to stop being the object of the perception of others, but to become the subject of their own history. And this is critical. This is deep and difficult. Why? Because you have just to stop looking at yourself through the eyes of 
you know, which is the very meaning of alienation. Alienation, when you are alienated, if you think of yourself through the eyes of the other. So you have to reconcile yourself with your own tradition. So and this is why for some people, and by the way, you were asking why I might be perceived as dangerous. Because this is exactly what I refuse to do. I am not going to waste my time answering your questions. And by the way, I question your questions. You know, when some, someone is coming to me and say, are you first a Swiss or are you first a Muslim? My first answer is silly question. <laughs> because when I am going to vote, I am a Swiss first. And when I am going to die, I am a Muslim first. I'm not dying with my passport. <laughs> I'm dying with my faith. And when I'm voting, I'm not voting with only my faith. My faith couldn't direct me to choose, but I'm, dying. I'm voting in this country because of my passport. So the point is that depending where I am, I am something first and, and something else first, depending on the context. The context is deciding, and I, am, I have multiple identities. So to keep and waste my time responding to your perception is putting me in a situation where I'm, I'm failing by definition because I, I can't just be someone who is responding to your perception. So I have to reconcile myself. And why it's dangerous? Because the very starting point of everything that we have to do for Muslims today is be confident. Reconcile yourself with this tradition. It's a deep and rich tradition. And with this tradition, you are able to come to the country and to say, I don't have a problem with being an American. I don't have a problem abiding by the law. If and only if the government is going to apply the law equally to every citizen. In if and only if. Because if you are asked to abide by the law, because we don't have a problem with the law. We have a problem with the people who are implementing the law. We have a problem with the readers of the law, that sometimes they are quite biased in the way they deal with this, the, the, the article. So we have here to come with this reconciliation from within, and the more we are reconciling ourselves with the roots, the, the legacy, and the whole framework, you come and you, we are able to say, first, with confidence, we are Muslim by religion, American by culture, we abide by the law, and we are going to be a contribution. And this is a very important challenge for us in our society today, uh, in our, the Western societies, as part of uh, what we have to do. And this is where you come not as responding to a call that you have to integrate. For me, integration is a concept of the past. The only right concept for me today is contribution. A citizen contribute contributes wherever she or he is, what is going to be your added value in the society, your added ethical value. So this is a challenge where you deal with sociology, we deal with history, you deal with culture, and you integrate in your understanding all the dimensions. Is It has to do with creativity, it has to do with contributing in all the fields, in uh, uh, movies, and I have to repeat to Muslims, is halal. To music, it's halal. Because some Muslims are thinking that everything which has to do with entertainment and music and, and movies is unlawful. It's as if, as Muslims, uh, the only thing which is lawful is just to stick to the principles. No, we have a very great tradition of culture, uh, arts, entertainment. This is so important for us. This is the way to feel good wherever we are. So we have to reconcile ourselves with this tradition and to come with uh, an ethical added value. And then, and I will end with this, what we have also to, to add to this is in the contemporary world is how do, when we are reconciling ourselves with our tradition, our principles, this diversity of interpretations, we are promoting an applied ethics in all the fields. So for example, what we are experiencing in the Muslim majority countries, it's very important. You know, at the beginning, these people who were in the streets asking for dignity, freedom, no corruption, no dictatorship, 
Uh, at the beginning, we were listening to them, say, oh, we have to be careful, they might be fundamentalists. And then we just acknowledged the fact that all these people who were in the streets were not at all Islamists or, 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 or extremists. They were men and women, and by the way, very uh, a huge number of women being involved in these movements asking for liberation. In fact, they were in the streets uh, asking for the rights that we are cherishing and for the, the values that we are sharing. But we sometimes, because we saw in them the same values as us, we forgot or we were uh, 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 forgetting the fact that they are still Muslims. So they were sending us a message and they are from where we are and they are experiencing in Muslim majority countries the fact that the Muslim citizens in Muslim majority countries, they want exactly what we want. They want freedom and they want dignity and they want uh, uh, the end of corrupt regimes. And we need to get it right here. So in the Muslim majority countries, one of the, the, the great and important challenge when it comes to human sciences, when it comes to sociology and politics, is for the Muslims to find a way beyond this very simplistic polarization that we have now in the discourse, the political discourse, and I'm, 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 I'm studying this in the last book, is this simplistic polarization between secularists and Islamists. And the two polar, the, 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 the two uh, group or the, the tensions, this polarization is between that are people getting their legitimacy against the other. So the secular against the Islamists by saying we are more progressive. The Islamists by responding to the progressive, we are the guardians of religions and the religious values. But the deep question of the social setting, social justice, political vision, the, 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 the economic stability, are they responding to these deep questions? These are questions that as Muslim majority countries, they have to come with a political vision and to promote an ethical framework from which they think about setting new societies and a, a new future. These are very deep questions, and we don't get that so far. So far, we, are st we know what we don't want, but we are not clear on what we really want as the future. So this is a critical discussion when it comes to culture. One of the, the you know, the, the educational systems in many of the Muslim majority countries, not only in the Arab world, not only in the Middle East, but everywhere. We have to question what we are teaching. Are we really teaching our uh, new generations in the Muslim majority countries to be critical, to come with critical thinking, to read books? There is a lack of interest and promotion of reading in the Muslim majority countries. If you, you look at the, the production on Arabic books, it's just a shame that this is not today at the level which is expected. And we have to deal with this. It's a challenge when it comes to knowledge. It's very easy to say Islam promotes knowledge. But what about the Islamic or the Muslim majority countries today? Are they promoting this critical thinking? And you can go back to the past by saying, look at what was uh, in Dalusia with all these philosophers. And yes, this was the past. What about the present? What about sciences today? What is the contribution of Muslim majority countries in everything that has to do with sciences? And the great majority of the scholars who are equipped and bright, they are coming to the West. And the West is very happy to welcome some of these immigrants, this selective welcome to the people who have a brain, but not the poor people. And by the way, it's a shame for all of us. And when I'm saying this, I'm not saying only this for the West. When you go to petrol monarchies and you see the way they are dealing with immigrants, it's a shame. That's not acceptable. The way the poor people coming from Pakistan, from Philippines, you know, the, the, the Philippines, and all, the way they are treated, and the way we treat immigrants, is just shame. If our citizenship is about talking about our rights, and treating people with no dignity because we are forgetting that they are human beings only because they don't have the same passports, I think it's a shame. But this is a common challenge where as uh, 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 contemporary 
uh, Muslims or Muslims living in this contemporary world, we have to deal with this. We have also to deal with one of the main uh, challenges uh, of our society, and it's women. And this is not to please the West, because very often Muslims say, oh, we always have to talk about women because the West is criticizing us. I don't care about the criticisms that are coming. Once again, I'm saying we have to reconcile ourselves with our tradition. And in the name of our tradition, what is done to women in Muslim-majority countries has nothing to do with the Islamic tradition. It's much more cultural than Islamic. So we have to come back to the very essence of what is Islamic to be critical towards the cultural uh, 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 behavior and the cultural projection that is the reality of the Muslim majority country. And this is a deep challenge. It's, it's really important. And this is why I'm always saying to Muslim women, please don't play the victim and don't nurture a victim mentality. Stand up for your rights as all the people who are facing discrimination should do. Yes, you can be the victims, but not nurture, do not nurture the victim mentality. It's exactly the same as we are in the West. And what I'm saying to all the Western Muslims is, yes, yes, you can be victims of discriminations and, and stigmatization. That's all true. The point, and there is a difference between being the victims and to nurture a victim mentality and to carry on blaming the society. You stand up for your rights and you will find in the American society and you will find in the Western society many fellow citizens that are ready to work with you to just struggle for what is right. And it's exactly the same in Muslim majority countries when it comes to women. You will find Muslim men. You will find people who are ready to struggle for your rights. So this is also something which has to do with our challenges. It's an applied ethics in the, using Islam as a tool, as in a vehicle that is helping you to face the cultural uh, uh, the cultural discrimination and sometimes some religious interpretations to show how uh, some interpretations are wrong. Having said that, so this is something that has to do with how do we promote uh, 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 education, how do we deal with uh, contemporary challenges. I, I'm not going to mention all the challenges that we have in common. When it comes to environment, in Muslim majority countries, it's as if we are not dealing with this. We are very close to the rituals. Too many Muslims are obsessed with the fact that we slaughter animals. How do we kill them? But the Islamic tradition is not only how about, about how you kill animals, it's how you keep them alive. How do you respect species? How do you respect nature? This discourse for contemporary Muslims is essential. And all the Western Muslims should be at the forefront of this struggle with their fellow citizens and to send back a message to Muslim-majority countries is also our struggle, that we care about the environment, we care about nature, we care about animals, and we will eat halal food, which is lawful from an Islamic viewpoint, if we care about the way we deal with the creation, with nature and with the animals. And if our fellow citizens are saying the way you treat animals is problematic for us, we, I would respond the way we all treat animals in this industrialized world is problematic if you have a conscience, if you have a dignity. You can't just deal with, we have to deal with this as something which is a common challenge. And I would say that this could be and should be something that we can do if we come back to the very essence of our respective traditions and we communicate from the center. I am I'm hoping that we'll come to a dialogue between respective traditions, atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, Jews, Muslims, Christian, whatever, and Muslims, whoever, but not a dialogue at the periphery of our traditions, but from the center. So the essence of who we are and what we are uh, uh, standing for. And this is where ethics is so important. Our universal, uh, the shared principles that we may have. And this is where I think that in such a gathering, it's important to get it right. It's complex, it's difficult, but it's possible. We have, we have lots of things to do together and many, many potentialities in the, if we only understand that. And let me conclude with this. Uh, having said all this and coming to the center, I think that there is also one thing which is essential as uh, uh, one of the main challenges in our contemporary world. 
And you know, 89 to 90% of my talks, when it comes to deal uh, with the Western societies or the contemporary world, it's very much about all these problems and, and I, I, I come from these problems to the center. But at the end, there is one challenge, which for me, it's, it's important. At the end of the day, as a Muslim, I am a believer. And I think that the very essence of believing in God or having principles is something which is, what about your inner life, your intimate peace? And I think that one of the main challenges that we have in our industrialized society, in, in our contemporary world, our modern world, is that we have lots of technology and progress and it's going very fast. What about this peaceful inner life? What about getting peace? What about what we call in Arabic salamat in nafs, which is feeling good and at peace with yourself, not being distracted at the periphery, but being peaceful at the center. And I think that all the religious tradition, and this is why you have, you know, this kind of exotic traditions or perceived as exotic that are attracting people because this is why we are trying to get this inner peace. And I think that all our traditions, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, we have to come back to the center. We have to come back to the true philosophical question. How do you get this well-being and the very meaning of life that you are questioning? And you know, when I talk like this, it's just not about uh, peace and love. And no, it's deep. It's very deep and, and often the people, they think, oh, it's not really within academia because we speak about rationality. Within academia, we should speak about rationality, but we speak about being reasonable. We should speak about feeling good. We should speak about the very meaning of life. So the spiritual answer is not to talk about having, but talking about being. Talking about what is this meaning? What is your answer to the deep question of what is the meaning of your life? And I think that at the periphery of our spiritual life, for any Muslim today, it's a very, very difficult challenge. Because you have to come back and say, okay, at the end of the day, why am I here? What I'm trying to do with my life? And this is where I find Christians and Jews and all the people of, you know, this deep question we are coming together. And it has to do with respecting your own heart responding to the needs of our minds and our conscience when it comes to the very essence of life. And when we deal with this, uh, an Islamic tradition, we are dealing with this. And, and you know, we all get this when you are mothers and fathers, and we look at our kids and say, what am I giving you? What, is the, what are the instruments I'm giving you to remain an, an, an autonomous human being? Is it just to be the first at school, to be good at your, within your academic uh, 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 career, or is it deeper than that? To be an autonomous, to have a conscience, to be a man and a woman of dignity. How do you transmit dignity, by the way? How do you give to someone a sense of that you have to be dignified, that you have to be consistent, that you should be the first, but never forget the last? that you have to serve people. How do you transmit this sense of solidarity? How do you transmit that as citizens you don't only have rights, you have duties? How do you deal with this when you say to the people, with, with, when you deal with the creation, that's all good to try to have whatever you want, but you need to respect the creation, you need to respect nature. How do you get this? How do you get this sense that you can be living in the United States of America and you have 60 million people who are facing poverty in this society. How are you going to deal with this? If you are not serious about our tradition, so I can be at the periphery of my tradition and say, you know what? We are nice, kind, we are peaceful. But at the end, my added value is not this. I'm not feeling a Western citizen only to be by accepted by my fellow Western citizen. I want with them to understand our duties as human beings, which is to change the societies for the better. It's essential. Don't ask me to be integrated and to disappear. I want to be visible to reform. This is a, an ethical visibility. 
And it's a challenge because the Muslims very often, they tend to think that the best way is to disappear. And even some Muslims and some Arabs to be accepted in the United States of America or in the West are changing their names. Muhammad becomes Mo. Because Mo is less, is less Arab, is less Muslim. If we are at that level of alienation, we are not succeeding. And in the Muslim majority countries, it's exactly the same. We are not here and we should not expect from them to please us. Let them find their way, but share with them the principle of dignity. By asking our governments in the West, stop supporting dictators, stop supporting tyrants, stop supporting corruption. Be right here and consistent there. And for us to help the people there and to understand that in Muslim majority countries there are trends of people who are working for dignity, freedom, and this is also part of our spiritual uh, message. Uh, so this is why we are working. And, and this is what I think that we have to contribute. We just started a center between Oxford and Qatar working on Islamic legislation and ethics, where we are trying now to do exactly this, reconciling ourselves with the Islamic traditions and putting scholars of the text and scholars of the context together in 11 fields, in education, in gender issues, in, uh, in um, uh, environment, in arts, in, in uh, uh, medicine, in, in all these fields, in politics, in uh, food, trying to push them to work together with Muslims when it comes to scholars of the text and even people of other faiths when it comes to specialists in fields and to come together and say, now produce an applied ethics for today between the two knowledges. Help us to come with something which is efficient, that is helping us to change the world for the better. Because at the end of the day, if there is something that I heard and understood from my tradition is if you are true to your values, true to your religion, look at the world and understand that what God is expecting from you is not to look at the world and just to integrate into the world the way it is, but to reform it for the better. And this is where I find the Christians. This is where I find the Jews. This is where I find all the traditions. We are here to reform the world for the better. And if our spirituality is not for this, I don't understand the very meaning of being a man and a woman of God or of meaning of a philosophical tradition in this world. Thank you.